Welcome back to the Tom Hartman program. I'm Alex Austin filling in for Tom, and uh, we're just going to keep this discussion going. Come on, my business partner at We Act Radio, weactradio.com, and I were talking about the corporate media and how they have an agenda, which is very clear, and they can drive that agenda uh, through active, overt, cheerleading for war, for example, which is always gross to watch. Uh, seemingly, they can't help themselves. But there's also a more subtle form of propaganda that I find uh, to be more pervasive and possibly, I mean, uh, pushing for war is about as damaging as you can get. But the, the, um, com the total damage that's done by not telling certain stories and the media not allowing certain stories to be told is incredibly powerful. And that, it, it takes a lot of forms, but, you know, they say, okay, well, these are the parameters of the debate and, you know, encourage rigorous debate within those parameters, but anything outside of that, you can't talk about. And there is a way that ideologues uh, in Congress actually can literally make it impossible to tell certain stories, and that is by getting rid of the data that's needed to tell those stories. And uh, I'm really happy to be joined uh, in studio by uh, Heidi Hartman, who is the president and CEO of the Institute for Women's Policy Research uh, and a fantastic economist who just had a column in PBS, How Government Data is Crucial for Everyone's Progress. Heidi, thanks for joining us on the Tom Hartman program. It is my pleasure to be with you. So that fact of getting rid of the data, like what that is, it's actually impossible to say, talk about um, disparities of wealth or education or opportunity uh, amongst race and ethnicity if you don't have that data, right? That's exactly correct. And interesting you should pick wealth because we don't have as many data sets that uh, talk about wealth as they do about income or employment, whether or not you have a job, what you're making on the job. And those tend to be specialized data sets. One is the survey of income and program participation. That has already suffered cut cutbacks even before Trump because data is expensive and people are always looking for ways to cut it. So we used to ask a panel of households, the same households, every four months, all about their income and their wealth and their family composition. And and now that's down to once a year. So that's going to just be less accurate probably because you're not, you know, you have to now recall everything that happened in the last year at one interview instead of just having to recall what happened in the last four months. So that's an example of how a data set can be made weaker uh, when we have less money for it. I mean, obviously they, they have tried field testing to make sure that works, but it's not quite clear how it's coming out with that particular data set. So Heidi, uh, I just I want to maybe quibble, but it's you who tells me that you you said data is expensive, but it's really not that expensive, right? I mean, like it's not like protecting Donald Trump's uh, Mar de Lago <laughs> expensive. It's not like maintain, no. right? I mean, like no, it, it it might be expensive for me or you if we had to produce That's these data sets, right? But in That's terms right. of our collective ability to pay for things. It is an incredibly wise and quite small investment. That's exactly right. It is actually one-fifth of 1% 1 of the entire federal budget, which I believe is about $76 billion a year for all government agencies collecting all the data we have. That can be in agriculture. That can be in health. That can be in defense. But the census alone, that's the one most of us think of when we think of government data, the census, because we all have to answer it every 10 years, is $12 billion to conduct that decennial census. Now, all year long, every year, they're collecting other data, and they're preparing for the decennial census. That is one that's particularly at risk right now, and it was noticed as being at risk by the Government Accountability Office in a report in January. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, like, if this is, uh, if you're going to have policies that are directed at helping the people, right? At, at This is the people. It's our government. It works for us. We want policies that are directed to us and not to continue an upward redistribution of uh, wealth from my pockets into the pockets of Wall Street plutocrats, for example. 
in order to direct policy correctly, you need this data. Uh, and that is what the census is, is set up for. That's exactly right. One of the main things we use the data for in this, that we get from the Census Bureau is how many people are poor. If your neighborhood has a lot of poor people, you are entitled to more federal assistance programs than if your neighborhood doesn't have a lot of poor people. Not only that, uh, the population is always moving. It's moving from the north to the south, from the uh, east to the west. And uh, when the population moves, we have to reapportion congressional seats. And we use that decennial census to reapportion congressional seats. That's why it's written into the Constitution that we have to actually count every single person in America on, in April of 2020. So the data is uh, incredibly important for policy decisions, uh, but the political implications of the census are also incredibly powerful. And, uh, you know, I think the story, we could spend an entire show talking about the story Absolutely. of 2010. Uh, and how the 2010 reapportionment, reapportionment uh, of political power was massively weighted against the Democratic Party. Um, and, you know, the gerrymandering that, is, that can happen from things like that, the, it will last for a decade. And it is so important to understand that the next decennial census in 2020, um, I will say it's actually slightly uh, or... I'm a little bit more optimistic because it is a presidential year that turnout uh, will be a lot higher there and that maybe there'll be a ability to focus on it leading up to it uh, in a way that we didn't see in 2010. Uh, but maybe I'm just being uh, optimistic there. I think you're being optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, let me just give you one, you know, example of why it's so, so important to have data. For example, we have the Family and Medical Leave Act. It's our only federal legislation that protects people who have to go on leave. And the way it protects you is to give you your job back if you should go out on leave for up to 12 weeks for a serious illness. Maybe you had a baby. Maybe the birth was difficult. And uh, your wife needs the full 12 weeks and you need some time off. And um, we have learned through data that the very people who need it most are the least likely to have to be covered by that law. You have to work for a firm that's about 50 or more people. You have to have worked at least a thousand hours a year. Uh, there's all kinds of requirements for being covered by that law. And those tend to leave out young parents, the very people who are most likely to have children. So, and low wage workers and people of color. So these are the kinds of things we learn by having the data. And what's going on now with the 2020 census is that uh, usually we're preparing in advance. We are opening field offices, we're conducting tests already because the budget has not been approved for this entire fiscal year. It has to have an extension now of some kind. They have had to cut that back. They've also cut back on technological innovations that were designed to help them do things more cheaply. And they've been told that they have to do the budget uh, for the same 12 billion in 2020 that they had in, in 2010. And of course we've had cost of living increase, but they did feel they could do it because of these technological changes. But now, they're behind schedule and implementing those because they don't have the budget set even for the current year. And Trump's proposal for next year is not increasing it enough. So uh, this is one of these cases where in my, you know, simplified telling of things, uh, the, the greedy liars on Wall Street, the money power, the global oligarchy, who they win by just kind of breaking the system, right? They actually, the, the, Good da data allows the people to be more fully in control of uh, government and the apportionment of resources and things like that. So it is in people's interests for this is kind of like uh, kneecapping the mailman and then complaining that the mail is late, um, which is a tried and true tactic of uh, the right wing. Um, and, you know, I know, uh, like I said, that's my in my simplified telling of things, but. There is and has been in pre-2010, uh, there was an attack on the census from the right wing. You would see this in right wing media. They would attack the census as, you know, big government intrusion on uh, people's uh, freedom, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a, 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 an attack. It's a propaganda attack on this thing as if uh, it is not set up to give more power to the people. That's right. And what we did in 2010, what the Census Bureau did in 2010 
was a tremendous amount of advertising, a tremendous large engagement campaign, especially to attract the people who tend to be under-enumerated, uh, people of color, poor people, people living in low-income areas. They get under-enumerated, which means that those areas are going to get fewer resources in the future based on all these formulas so that are written into our laws. So you really have to reach out to those people, and we reach out to them through advertising, radio campaigns. A lot of community groups get involved in trying to encourage people to respond to the census um, and, but it's difficult, and they, we often estimate that those very people are undercounted. But we had a massive effort in 2010, and I think what concerns me is that we won't have a, as massive an effort in 2020, and also we'll have things working in exactly the opposite direction. And that is that President Trump's war on immigrants, his Muslim ban, even if it's failed so far, all of these things are making the undocumented much, much less likely to want to answer a census questionnaire. Uh, also, it's going to be the first time that we're going to be responding online. So the fact that the the right, I agree with you, has been increasing the paranoia of people about all government statistics and telling them not to respond um, is going to be, possibly be even worse because now the response is supposed to be online. And is the Census Bureau going to be able to secure our online data? So it's a, 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 a situation in which, if anything, uh, it's looking worse for 2020 than 2010. That's why I said you were too optimistic. Heidi Hartman uh, from the Institute for Women's Policy Research, IWPR.org. Uh, you can find out more information about uh, the power of data and so much more in your research uh, that's available there. That is, you know, I, I talk a lot about storytelling uh, and the power of narrative and story. And that's why the corporate media having that ownership of it is so dangerous and why we need truth tellers like yourself who are saying we need to prepare for this now. We need to get set up now. We need to demand more resources into this now. Heidi Hartman, thank you so much for joining us on the Tom Hartman program. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you as always, Alex. You're listening to the Tom Hartman program. I'm Alex Lawson filling in for Tom, and we'll be right back.